Good morning again. And, and again, thank you for coming. There's uh, some of our group traveling and uh, some of our group, you know, there are people that are just various reasons. And it was pretty cold last week. Maybe some are a little afraid of coming back this week. But we're really grateful that you're all here and we're really grateful to be able to spend time in the Word. And we're really grateful that we just have this opportunity to gather together, to fellowship, to to en enjoy each other in the presence of the Lord and to open up His Word and to um, hear from Him. What we've been doing, and so there's some that haven't been here yet, what we've been doing is we've been going through the book of Romans. We've been going through uh, verse by verse, word by word. It's called... Uh, uh, expository type of teaching and um, we've been in chapter 1 verses 1 through 6 for quite some time and really studying about the nature of God the nature of Christ and all of that and it's been a real blessing I mean it's been a, an enormous blessing and today through the week I was planning on continuing that and we were going to we we're moving into the, the, the concept of the Trinity which is spelled out in Romans 1 1 through 6 the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit are all present in those verses and we were going to actually just get get down with that concept what does that mean what is the trinity how do we define it and all of those things that's where we were heading um, but this week there were some events that have occurred in in just the life of the church universal in the life of the church in Santa Clara County in particular that kind of jerked my thoughts out of that and onto another path that uh, I want to spend some time going through. Um, and what we're going to start today is probably going to be a three-week series about this topic. So one of the things that happened this week was uh, Pastor Mike McClure, the Calvary Church in San Jose on uh, Hillsdale and Almaden, uh, had a court hearing, and that church has been meeting... It never stopped meeting, and uh, it's been thriving, and it's been, I mean, it's been a church of church refugees, right, that have been just gathering there with him because people are so hungry to, for the fellowship and for the preaching of the word and for, for the church life, the body life of the church, and they've been getting fines after fines after fines week after week, and not just the church, but now he and his associate pastor personally, and there was a threat of jail time and all of that kind of stuff happening so there was a hearing this week and 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 the Lord was gracious and and um, there were some restrictions put on how they meet but still they're able to meet and 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 we'll see how the fines get mitigated and things like that but but it went in a you know okay direction but in in my own world there's churches that are meeting and there's churches that are not meeting uh, there's another pastor who's a dear friend of mine, Pastor Jack Treber, who is a pastor of uh, uh, North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara, uh, uh, just an old school fire and brimstone preaching, you know, sawdust trail traveling, get saved and, you know, Sunday school buses going out all over the place and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids coming to the Lord. And uh, they had put a pause on meeting for a while and then they started meeting again and they're also accumulating probably five thousand dollars a day in fines and all of that kind of thing and it's really escalating and of course we all probably most of us have you know know of John MacArthur down in uh, Southern California Grace Community Church and you know in his seminary and all that and 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 so there were all kinds of things that the county of Los Angeles was trying to put a halt to them meeting once they decided to open up again and so those are all people that I really respect and love and, and know two of them personally. And then on the other side, there's pastors who are not meeting yet, and, and I know some of them personally as well. And I love and I respect them. Some are, you know, closer than a brother. And so I know that they're really seeking the Lord. They're really pursuing the Lord and trying to, you know, understand for themselves and for their local body what's best. Can we meet? And so they're you know, meeting online or they're doing those kind of things, but they're not meeting. And, and for us here, you know, we had a, 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 a group that meets in a barber shop and, it, and he's sitting right here, it's his shop, and that's been going on for years. And um, there's several here who are part of that and been part of that. And, 
And the Lord was really working in and through that group as well, you know. And then when all of this happened in March, the second week of March, um, we stopped. And, and uh, probably a month later, we started again. Because we're like, well, we can meet in a barber shop and we can be safe and we can comply and, and we're just going to do it. And we did it. And then as churches were still not meeting, we decided let's meet in the park on Sunday mornings. Just, let's just do it and invite your friends and your family members and things like that. And so we, we've been doing that since August. And then we had to come here for the winter. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we're very blessed and thankful. But through the course of history, you know, if we think back through the last 2,000 years of the history of the church, and if we think back through just the last uh, 100 years in our own national history as it relates to the church as well, we know of a number of things. Uh, how many of you remember 9-11? All of us do. We all know where we were. We all know what we were doing the moment it happened. And we also all know that when that happened, I remember Ko and I, uh, we were working up on a hill in Almaden. And that day, we're looking out over the entire Santa Clara Valley, and it was as if the sky had fallen. The skies were empty, and everybody had stop to take a collect collective breath at what had happened and what were going to be the consequences. And the following Sunday, every single church in the United States was packed. Everybody went to church. We want answers. We are grieving. We need to pray together. And, and whether people knew the Lord or not, they were going to church because that is where they found comfort and solace and strength and the word of God and the fellowship of the saints to strengthen us through that dark time in our history. Um, I was thinking back through our history when uh, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy when the news traveled back to the mainland of what had happened in Pearl Harbor, again, a collective holding of our breath and a sudden grieving and wondering and, and knowing what was coming perhaps. Were we gonna enter into this war that we called the European War up to that time and now is gonna become World War II. And so the following Sunday, churches were packed. You couldn't find a place to sit or even stand as people sought the Lord in the midst of, of, uh, of the terrible things that were transpiring and the terrible things that were coming. In uh, September of 1939, when the news traveled back into Britain that the Nazis had crossed the border into Poland, they knew that war had begun. And that Sunday, churches were packed. In Sarajevo, in 1911, a young uh, nationalist fired a gun at Archbishop, our Archduke Joseph Ferdinand, the Archduke of that nation state, and he was assassinated. And a whole chain of events began to unravel and I said 1911, it was 1914, sorry. A whole chain of events began to unravel and World War I broke out. And millions of people perished in the fields of Flanders and, and, and in Europe and in uh, even other parts of the world. Millions of men died in the trenches and, and, and again, when that moment happened, and as the world began to see what was coming, churches were packed all over Europe because people sought the Lord and sought the fellowship of the saints. 
And in March 2020, we heard that millions were going to die. And therefore, we had to stop everything. And, and it was again as if the sky had fallen and the roads were empty and the stores were empty and we all held our collective breaths. But we couldn't go to church. That's what we do. And that's what the nation does when tragedy strikes. But we couldn't go to church. And so pastors and church leaders were scrambling. How can we minister to the flock in the midst of what's happening? And, you know, Zoom stock went through the roof. And, 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 and Facebook Live meetings started to happen. And Zoom meetings and, and YouTube sermons and postings. And people were trying to, to be the church online. Uh, but it just wasn't enough. It just wasn't enough. So here we are today, and right now, where we have some churches still not meeting, some churches meeting, some of us being hybrids and doing what we can. And in some respects, we've become like a circular firing squad because we're sniping at each other now. Because the ones that are meeting are like, you gotta meet, and I get that, we're meeting. But the ones that aren't meeting, they are pursuing the Lord. They're searching the Lord. They're, they're grieving that they can't meet. I know this. I know them personally. And, and yet they feel that they're constrained in, in not meeting. And so I've heard pastors preaching on passages that we're going to look at today. And, and coming down on, uh, to defend their positions, whatever those positions are. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at those passages today. And we're going to break down the primary passage that talks about the church and state relationship. That's what we're going to spend time talking about. The relationship of the church and the state and our responsibilities and our roles in that relationship. And we're just going to let the word of God speak for itself. And then we're going to draw conclusions. But beyond that, because the question that we're really going to ask is, is civil disobedience sanctioned by God in any way, shape, or form? We're going to ask that question, and we're going to answer that question, and then we're going to go through the Old Testament and the New Testament and look at as many examples as we have time for about when those things occur. And then we're going to go beyond that, and we're going to look at the history of the church from the apostolic era through today, and beyond, and look at prophetic passages to see what's coming, what God says is coming for the church, and how we need to be prepared, and how we need to respond. So that's why I say it's going to take three meetings to get through all that. So today, we're going to begin by reading through the three passages that talk about the relationship between church and state. First one we're going to read is in 1 Peter chapter 2. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 11 through 17. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to read verses 13 through 17. And I'm going to burn through these verses, these chapters. We're going to read them quickly. And then we're going to spend our time on Romans chapter 13. And we're going to break that down because that's the primary passage. So here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave, as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That's passage number one. Titus, chapter three, verses one and two. Titus, chapter three, verses one and two. 
Here we go. Remind them, he's talking to the pastors, remind your flock to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. That's Titus chapter two, uh, 3, verses 1 and 2. And now we'll turn over to Romans chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which, which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive judgment upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause for fear, of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it the governing authority, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right, you ready? Here we go. In this passage in Romans, there are four commands. Four. They coincide with commands of Titus and the commands also that are found in 1 Peter. There are four commands. Be in subjection, number one. Do good. That's number two. Do good. That's from verse three. Okay. Verse four says, be afraid. That's the third command. And verse seven says, render. Render. And that's the fourth command. Be in subjection. Do good be afraid, and render. Be in subjection is used in all three. That same word, that same grammatical breakdown, and it's in the passive tense. Allow yourself to be in subjection. Allow yourself to be subject, and it's the passive tense. The rest are active. Do good. Be afraid if you do wrong. And it's interesting to me that that be afraid is actually a command. It's not a, a warning, it's a command. If you do wrong, be afraid. And then finally, render or give. So those are the four commands. Now, we have a series of descriptions of who we are referring to. There's two words that are used to describe the governing authorities. There's the word for, uh, that's translated ruler. It's used one time. And it is in verse one. Governing, governing. It's that word governing. And that means someone who is over you. Someone who's over you, in authority over you. And then there's the second word, that is used for the governing authorities, and it's the word that's translated in my Bible, authority, and it's translated here four times, authority. Verse one, verse two, and in verse, yes, twice, in, uh, verse one, verse two, and I'll find the other one in a minute because I didn't underline it. So three times that that word is used. Now, I want to define that word authority because that's the common word that is used for the people who govern us. 
It could also refer to, if you didn't know this, your parents. It refers to any authority that's over you. It could refer to your parents if you're living under the roof of your, of your home, of your parents' home. It could be them. It could be your boss at work. It could refer to them, that person. It could be the person who's your professor in class. That's an authority over you. And clearly, it could be a governing authority. It could be the dog catcher. It could be the building department inspector. It could be the public works inspector. It could be the police officer or the fireman or the, the mayor or the city council or the governor or the, or the uh, legislative bodies that rule over us all the way up to the president of the United States. It could refer to any and all of those. Authority. That word authority, it's interesting where that word comes from. If I say it in Greek, you might recognize it. Ek emi. And it means out of me. Remember, we talked about the word Yahweh and Jesus and the great I am. That was ego emi. I, I am. Emi is the common word with authority here and that word that Jesus used of himself. Out of me. Out of who? The authority comes out of God. And he dispenses authority to those whom he places in those positions. The authority is from God. And if we, that's the noun form. If we look at the verb form, it's usually translated lawful. In other words, authorities come from God. And when an authority is in its rightful position before God, it is considered lawful authority. It is understanding that it has a responsibility before God to act in accordance with the laws of the land and the institutes that God has ordained. There, there is what has been come to be called natural law, but it's the moral law that we all find in our hearts, the things that God has shown us in his word and has imprinted on our consciences. And this is what they are to uphold, is God's design and desires. That's a lawful authority, and he puts people in that place. It doesn't mean that they're all Christian. Clearly, it doesn't mean that. But they are in place because he put them there and their job is to maintain his righteous rule and decrees, the moral authority that we all understand. Now, that word is used 102 times in the New Testament. Jesus used it, used it in Matthew 28, 18. Remember that passage? What did he say? It's the last words to his disciples. All what? All authority is given to me. All authority is given to me. See, there's that coming from God directly. All authority is given to me. And then he goes on and gives his great commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, making disciples of all people, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. So Jesus has this authority, and he is the supreme authority because it says later in also the Gospels that God has given him complete and total authority over the entire cosmos. It is in his hands, and that's why he is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is over all. God has given him authority, and through him, through Jesus, authority is dispensed on the earth. That word is used also in John chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. Jesus is having a conversation at his trial. Pilate is who he's conversing with. Pilate is an official representative of Rome. He's the governor of that entire province. And Jesus is before him, and Pilate says, don't you know that I have the authority to free you or to kill you? And Pilate is recognizing that his authority is coming from Rome. 
Therefore, it's a lawful authority. And Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go one further. You don't have authority but from God. Your authority derives from God. And none of this would happen if he wasn't allowing it. So Jesus took it a whole nother level. But your authority is coming from God. That is also used in Acts chapter 8, verse 19. Simon, the magician, the disciple, the apostles are out. Philip is out. Peter comes alongside. Uh, and souls are getting saved and miracles are happening. And Simon, the magician, sees these miracles happening. And he wants to become a follower of Christ. He has a reputation. This is in Samaria. He has a reputation as being a, a, a great magician performing miraculous things. And all of the crowds now are looking at the followers of Jesus and, and people are being healed and people are being saved. And then Simon, he's just like, he's taking all along now. He's a part of that crowd. He wants to be in on it. And he sees that when Peter arrives and, and more people are saved and then tongues begin, people start speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit comes and, and it's again evidence that God is at work and this is authentic and all of this is happening. And Simon goes, Give me this power. And that's the word he used. Give me this authority. I want this authority. And Peter looks at him and goes, you know what? You better get, your, you better get yourself straightened out because you're, you're, you're on the pathway to destruction. Yeah, you need to repent. You've got to get the right perspective. That's in Acts chapter 18. And there's a lot of other places where that word is used that way. But I also want to draw your attention to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. That's the passage that concerns spiritual warfare. You're familiar with it? I think most of you are. In verse 12, that's the passage where we're told to armor up. Put on the full armor of God, right? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then it goes into a description of armor. But it precedes that in verse 12 with this. For we, we wrestle not, we're not battling against flesh and blood. But we're battling against powers. And authorities. And spiritual wickedness in high places. We're battling against demonic authorities. And it's the same word. We're battling against demonic authorities. We're not battling people. We're battling the great enemy of God and of people. We're battling demonic authorities. That word is also used in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, where it's describing death and Hades having authority. That word is also used in Revelation chapter 9 verses 3, 10, and 19 where it's describing demons who are given authority for a time to do things. It's described in Revela that word is used in Revelation chapter 13 verses 2 and 7 where it's describing the beast or the antichrist who is given authority. And that word is used in Revelation 17, 12 where it's describe, describing kings who rule, human kings who rule on this earth with the beast during that time period. So you see, are we having fun back there? Just curious. So you see that all of these that we're saying have authority, ultimately their authority or their their ability to do what they're doing and their ability to rule, their authority and the sphere of rule that they have, all of it ultimately derives from God. But is all of it, is all of it just? Is all of it righteous? And does all of that, does that apply here to Romans chapter 13 or Titus or 1 Peter? Of course not. That's ridiculous. In fact, we are told that those kind of authorities, the demonic powers and authorities, those are the ones that we're to fight and to battle against. Okay? Now, let's just put a pause on that for a minute because there are two words that are used to describe our response or 
what we're not supposed to do with the God-given authorities that are over us. It says two things. Do not resist, and this is down on number three of your notes. Number one, don't resist. Number two, don't oppose. Don't resist and don't oppose. The word resist is active. It means to arrange yourself in battle formation against these governmental authorities that are being described by Paul. That word's used five times in the New Testament. Here's one, Acts 18.6. It talks about the Jews that are resisting Paul as he's trying to preach the gospel. In James chapter 4, verse 6, and in 1 Peter 5, 5, it talks about this. It says, God resists the proud. He stands against, he stands arrayed against the proud. And it's used in James 5, 6, where it talks about wealthy people who are in authority, who persecute the poor, the downtrodden, those who labor for them. And it says, you are taking them to court, you are killing them, you are abusing your authority, and they did not even resist you. And so it's used there, that's the fifth time, okay? To actively arrange yourself and battle against. That's the first word that says we are not to do. Second word is we are not to oppose, and that's a passive tense. We are not supposed to just dig our heels in and say, forget it, I am not doing that, you know, like kids do or like we do at times. Just refusing to move. Refusing to move. That is, uh, word is used in James chapter 4, verse 7, and 1 Peter 5, 9, where we are admonished to resist the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That which means, dig your heels in. No, I'm not going to do it. Be like that stubborn mule, or like that horse that was not wanting to get out of here today. <laughs> I am not going in that trailer. You can't make me. <laughs> you guys missed a lot of the fun there this morning. Yeah. So this is just a simple and quick breakdown of this passage in Romans. We have four commands. We have two words to describe the authorities over us and an understanding of what that means. We have... Uh, two, two words that describe how we're to respond to those authorities. But let's just break down for a moment the responsibilities that are given here by the authorities and how God's describing the actual authority. We have eight things. Number one, they're above us. They are authorities over us. They stand over us in authority. Number two, they are, it says literally in the Greek, by God. They are authorities by God. Number three, it says they are also instituted by God. These are our governing authorities. Number four, they are ordered by God. Number five, they are ministers of God. Number six, they are avengers of wrath. And in that same section, it talks about they bear the sword. They have the right to take up the sword to make sure that justice prevails. Number seven, they are servants of God, they are called. And number eight, they devote themselves to being servants of God in authority over us. This is the descript description that Paul uses of of what a proper governing authority should look like. They are operating under the umbrella of God. They are understanding their roles. They are, even if they're not believers, they are operating with moral principles and biblical principles in mind. Everybody wants to point out this fact, and so we have to acknowledge this fact, that when Paul wrote this, and when Peter wrote what he wrote, and when Paul wrote what he wrote to Titus, who was the 
head over all the governing authorities at that time on a human scale. It was a man called Nero. We must understand that. We get that. He was a man called Nero. We acknowledge that. Paul's writing this in that context. Nero was the governing authority. So I hear a lot of people say, well, if that's the case, we don't have anything like that now, so we've got to comply. We've got to do whatever they say. Well, we can't say that, and let me tell you why. And we'll expand on that more next week because we're coming to a close now. Because at the time Paul wrote this, and at the time Peter wrote that, and, and later on when more persecution was happening and more terrible things were happening, uh, we've gone into some descriptions of how Nero persecuted the church during his reign. But during the time of Nero and later persecutions at the, in the apostolic era, they did resist. They did dig their heels in. They did absolutely resist and dig their heels in. There was a time when to gather and to be caught gathering was a death sentence. It was a death sentence. Yet they gathered anyway. They would get up before the dawn. They would sneak out if they were slaves from the master's home. They would gather in the fields or the caves, or the forests, or the mountains, wherever they could, as the body of Christ, to worship together, and to fellowship together, and to encourage each other, and to preach the word, and to hear the word. Yes, they resisted. Yes, they dug in. They were told not to gather. And they did it anyway, at the very risk of intense torture and death at very least, economic destitution, losing everything if they had anything. Also, during that time period, they were asked merely to perform this simple civic function. Everybody did it. The Roman Empire was a polyglot nation. Many nations were under the umbrella of the Roman Empire. Many cultures, many languages, many people. But they all needed to acknowledge one thing. And then they could go off and do their worship or go off and perform their own, you know, sacrifices to their own gods or whatever. But they got to do this one thing. It's a civic exercise to show our unity, to show that you are, we're all walking down this path together. All they had to do was say these words. Caesar is Lord. Now the implications of that in those days was that was more than just saying, yes, yeah, Caesar is in charge of the government. They were really ascribing to Caesar something more than he was, more than a man. Caesar is God. Well, you don't have to believe it. Just say it. Just pretend. Just do it. You're okay. That became a thing where the Christians really struggled with that. And there were some that said, yeah, it's not that bad. I mean, I don't really believe it. And they actually did say it. And so they were free to go on with their lives. They were free to continue their businesses. They weren't pulled into prison. They weren't tortured. They weren't thrown to the lions. They weren't burned or hung and burned on crosses. They weren't having their heads chopped off. If all they said were those three simple words and didn't even have to believe it, and the church struggled with that. And most said, never, 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 never. I'm going to pay my taxes. I'm going to honor the governing authorities. In fact, Justinian, uh, uh, I think it was Justin, the first apologist of the church, wrote a letter to the, to the emperor of that time and said, you know that the Christians are the best citizens in the entire Roman Empire. They never cause trouble. They pay their taxes. They agree. They, they support. The, they are the best citizens you've got. And yet, you're killing them. Because of those three simple words that re, they refuse to say. So, civil disobedience is literally woven into the fabric of the church from the very beginning. Now, right now, in our time and in our day, right this moment, 
this issue of gathering in a barn or outside or in a church with the restrictions that are placed on us, that's small potatoes. That's, they're not saying, don't gather or I'm going to kill you if you do. They're not saying, if you preach, I'm going to kill you. They're not saying, if you don't acknowledge that the prevailing worldview that is now completely taken over our nation and the entire world, if you don't agree with that, we're going to kill you, that's coming. But it's not here yet. So, we're going to spend next week reviewing all through the scriptures examples of civil disobedience and how and why and just build the theology of what is right and what is not right in our responses to today's world and into what's coming. And it's really important that we understand what's coming. And we will get there. Let's end with this. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read something to you. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. We'll end with this. Christ is being spoken of in chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is the hall of faith. It's the great heroes of the past and how many of them resisted even unto the point of death. And we'll, we'll just glance at that. But I want you to look at this in verse 3 and 4. Consider him, who? Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You, he says, have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And there's that word resist again. You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. It's not talking about shedding someone else's blood. It's talking about your own blood being shed. You have not yet reached that point. But resist any attempt to bring us to a place where we will disobey the commands of God. Here's the deal. I'm just going to leave you with this. Here's the quote. Not my quote. R.C. Sproul. And he did a whole series on civil, you know, church and state seven-part series, and, and I found the money quote from R.C. We must disobey if we're commanded to do something God forbids. We must disobey if we're commanded to do something God forbids. And we must disobey if we're forbidden to do something God commands. One of the commands is to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Let's pray. As we go to prayer, um, I just want to uh, provide an opportunity. And, you know, later on somebody might watch this video. And if you're, if you're watching this video, uh, this, this invitation is extended to you as well. Are you in Christ now? Have you surrendered to Christ? Is he your Lord and master? Have you submitted to him? And is he the ultimate authority in your life? If not, just pray this simple prayer with me, understanding that he died for our sins and he paid the penalty that was due us. He shed his blood on our behalf so that his righteousness can be imputed or transferred to us and our guilt and our shame and the punishment that was due us was laid on him. So let's
pray. This is just a simple prayer of salvation. If you believe that and you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, Lord, I know that you died on the cross for my sin. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And eternal separation from you is what is my due. But I know you paid the penalty for my sin. I know that as I surrender my life to you, that your righteousness is laid on me and my sin is laid on you. So Lord Jesus, I surrender myself now to you. And I ask you to just be my Lord. Save me from my sin. And enable and strengthen and empower me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.